church. It's great to see you in worship. Thank you for joining us today. Let's stand together and get ready to sing and lift up our voices with joyful praise this morning. We have a lot to be thankful for. One of those greatest things to be thankful for is the cross of Calvary. There at the cross, our guilt was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We can rejoice in that this morning and give him praise. So let's worship together. certainly is good to see you here today as we've gathered to worship the Lord and to think about what he did for us at Calvary. If you're a guest with us today, we're especially grateful that you chose to worship with us today. We know there are a lot of places you could have been, and we thank you for choosing to be here. We ask that you would just worship like one of us, pray with us, uh, sing with us, hear God's word together. If God leads you to respond, to do that, because we're really in the family of God together today. If you are a guest here, we would like to encourage you to stay for our pastor's reception. You'll hear more about that later. I uh, encourage you to be a part of that. We would ask everybody, whether you're here or whether you're listening online, if you're live streaming this today, to take your electronic device and go to fbclexington.com. There's a place there called Sunday Central. And if you'll open that tab, you can check in. And let us know how many are listening where you are. If you're here in the auditorium, there's a QR code on the back of the pew in front of you. 
that you can use to get to that. But we just like to have a, an understanding of who's in our service today, so we encourage you uh, to do that. And those of you that are listening online, we are grateful that you have chosen to join us, and we hope one day that you'll be able to come and worship with us in person uh, to be a part of this worship service. While you're there, you'll also see a place on that uh, website where you can see the announcements. You can see the uh, pastor's notes for the message today, a listening sheet uh, for the message. And you find a place that you can give. And we want to encourage you to give and to give faithfully uh, to the work of the Lord. There's a lot going on, a lot that is happening, and we need to be faithful to support uh, the Lord's work. And you can give there. Uh, you can also uh, bring it by the office, mail it to the office, put it in the receptacle at the back of the church, or you can give in person. Our ushers are going to come forward at this moment, and we're going to take the offering. And if you are desiring to, you can give here today in this worship service. Uh, so men, if y'all will come down, we will take the offering. Father God, we take this opportunity to thank you for so many gifts that you've given us and blessings that we've received from you. God, we take this opportunity to give back to you just a portion of that which you've given to us. God, we ask that you take these, these gifts of return to you, you multiply them so that we can expand your kingdom in a way that we can't even earthly imagine. God, thank you for these blessings and thank you for the opportunity and the freedom to do so. In Christ's name, amen. this morning so let's get down to business senior sunday is next week so we have got to get our awards for our seniors as always we're going to be doing our most likely twos so um let's get started with karen um karen's most likely to i need to speak to your manager i'm recording you get it because she's a karen well, that is her name. She just fits the stereotype so well. I don't want to use a stereotype. She's determined. She's very strong in her convictions. Not afraid to ruffle some feathers. So, she's most likely to always be right? Um, perfect. Uh, the next student is Chad. Chad is most likely to... Yo, dude! I'm definitely the biggest, strongest, bestest guy around. That was really unkind. <laughs> oh my stars. It's a joke. I was just saying he's like a Chad. As amusing as I think it could be, I feel bad using a stereotype. Chad is confident. Chad is a leader. Chad knows what he wants. So Chad is most likely to be in charge? Okay, great. So last but certainly not least is Christina. So Christina is most likely to... What? I was just waiting for you to make some kind of wisecrack about it. Well, nothing immediately comes to mind. She always seems to be willing to help people and is so good at loving them. I don't think I could bring myself to make fun of that. So, you don't have anything snappy to say about Christina? <laughs> she has such a love for understanding the Bible, and when her family lost her brother, I don't think I've ever seen someone who so completely clung to God. Yeah, that is about the same time that my daughter became a Christian. She saw Christina um, really cling to her faith during that difficult time, and she realized that she wanted that in her life, too. That's a really powerful testimony to have, and a phenomenal legacy to leave. So, most likely to leave a lasting legacy? Perfect. <laughs> we have that same opportunity to leave a lasting legacy for those around us. Let's stand together and continue our worship. Sing with us. Give your joyful praise to the Lord. Oh, uh -huh. 
so much mercy each and every day. He said in Romans 12, 1, in view of the great mercies that you received, live your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So let's respond to his mercy with our love, our faithfulness, and with our obedience. What love could be
Thank you so much this morning. I want you to take out your Bible. Look with me in Matthew chapter 3. We'll begin reading in a moment in verse number 1. We're going to continue our sermon series today of living and leaving a legacy. Today we want to talk about living and leaving a legacy of standing strong as we look at the life of John the Baptist from Matthew chapter 3. I heard about a man who smoked at least one pack of cigarettes a day. And then he began reading articles in magazines and newspapers and online. And he soon became alarmed between this strong relationship between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. He finally made an important decision and he went to his wife and he said this, Honey, I've been reading so many articles about smoking and lung cancer that I made a very important decision today. His wife said, oh, that's wonderful. Tell me about the decision. He said, I've decided to quit reading. <laughs> Not to quit smoking, but to quit reading. And you know, that's what a lot of people do, even in church. They'll read the Bible, they'll get convicted of their sins, and so they quit reading the Bible. They come into a worship service and maybe go to a Sunday school class and they get convicted of, of where they are with God, and so they just simply choose to quit, to give up. In our passage today, we see the life of John the Baptist, who was no quitter. He's not the kind of God that would give up He's not the kind of God that would throw in the towel. He's not that kind of God at all. In fact, he refused to give up. He was not the least bit intimidated by conventional wisdom, by religious pundits, or even those who would doubt the truths of God. He lived and left a legacy of standing strong for the Lord, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the crowd around him, regardless of the criticism that may have come his way. He drew a line in the sand and he said, I will stand strong for Jesus. In fact, we know this is true because Jesus himself would speak to the legacy of John the Baptist in Matthew eleven eleven. Jesus told his disciples this about John the Baptist. He said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. Wow, what a legacy. To hear those words from Jesus about our lives and our faithfulness and our witness and, and, and our willingness to stand strong in the face of adversity and persecution and hardship would just be absolutely amazing. Yet this is exactly what Jesus said of John the Baptist. So obviously there's something in John the Baptist today that we need to learn from his legacy of standing strong. We read about this today in Matthew the third chapter, beginning in verse number one. The Bible says, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he was the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit with consist that's consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Today we learn some very important characteristics about this man, John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. And in learning some things about him, we ought to be able to learn some things about ourselves as well that will help us to live and leave a legacy of standing strong. The question has to be asked, what was it in John the Baptist's life that we see which allowed him to live and leave a legacy of standing strong? Three things. Number one, he was willing to live and leave a legacy of standing strong because John the Baptist was a man of God, a person of God. One of the things that I learned when I was a 13-year-old student from my student minister, I learned also from the life of John the Baptist as he was teaching on John the Baptist one Wednesday night. What I learned was this truth. It's okay to be weird for Jesus. That's what I learned. It's okay to be weird for Jesus. You see, God prefers that you and I not look like or live like everybody else in the world. God created you and he created me to be unique. There is no other person on this planet that's like you or that is like me. God has gifted us. God has given us abilities. God has created us to be unique. And he wants us to live in that uniqueness and use it to make a difference for him in the lives of others all around us. And that is exactly what John the Baptist did in his world. In a world that he lived in the first century where everybody was trying to blend in, where everybody was trying not to stand out, or be noticed, especially by the Romans or the religious leaders of the day, John the Baptist stood out for the Lord. As a result, Jesus said, no one is as great as John the Baptist. He was a man of God. What about you? Could the same be said of you? Are you a man of God, a woman of God, a student of God? Or are you just trying to blend into the world, hoping nobody takes notice of you, but in doing so, you make no difference. Several things about John the Baptist that shows he's a man of God and was different. First, how he looked was different. He looked nothing like those around him. He was an Essene. He was from a small religious group that was dedicated to the things of God, that lived down where the, where the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered in Qumran. And so John the Baptist was a little bit different in the fact of the way that he looked. I mean, the Bible says <coughs> that like Elijah of old, he wore a camel hair garment and a leather belt. I mean, does that even go together? Who knows, right? But that's what he wore anyway. Everywhere he went, everybody recognized him because he wore a camel hair garment in the desert with a leather belt. He was certainly not a fashionista of his day, but his appearance alone would have gotten a lot of attention. And so how he looked was different. Secondly, where he was located was different. He was in the desert, not in Jerusalem, not in a synagogue, not in the temple, but in the desert. <coughs> he was down south near the Dead Sea in the Judean desert. The desert is really living on the fringe of society. The desert was a place of deprivation and death. The desert was a place of hardship and struggle. 
most people live their lives trying to avoid being in or going through the desert. But that's not what John the Baptist did. In fact, John the Baptist not only lived in the desert, but his ministry was in the desert. It's where he was preaching and baptizing people and showing them in the desert how life and hope can be found in the most unexpected of places, even in a desert. Thirdly, what he was leading was different. The way he looked was different, where he was located was different, but the way that he was leading was different. You see, John the Baptist was doing something completely different than everybody else around him. John the Baptist was baptizing people as a result of their repentance and confession of sin. Jewish people in the day of the first century, when it came to being, quote, baptized, this was not a new phenomenon that came about with John the baptizer. In fact, even before the time of Jesus, even before the first century, Jewish people had religious customs and rituals that before they would go to the synagogue, before they would go to the temple, they would get down in a, for lack of a better term, a giant baptistry, a bathtub, and they would cleanse themselves. They would basically give themselves a bath. They would wash themselves so that they thought that the washing of themselves physically was a symbol of them washing themselves internally so that they would stand pure before God. And those, those baptismals are called a mikvah. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem today, and there in Jerusalem, you can go to the place where you would have walked in the days of Jesus up to the temple, and they have now unearthed all these baptisms, all these baptismal uh, waters where they were at the time. You can see where they were. So they would go up to the baptismal waters, and then they would go up to the temple. Well, what John the Baptist was doing was completely different than that understanding. He was saying, those waters don't do anything but get you wet. And yes, you may be cleaned on the outside, but the cleaning you need is not on the outside. The cleaning you need before God is on the inside, and that only comes through confession and repentance. And when I baptize you, it is a symbol of your confession and your repentance. You see, John the Baptist wasn't going to allow God to be boxed in by human rules and rituals and traditions. And likewise, his baptism was a symbol of the repentance and confession of sin. He, think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, was, was inviting people to leave the city, to leave the comforts of their home, and go out into a dry, barren desert to confess and repent of their sins before God. He was asking them to walk out into the desert sands and to walk out of the sand and right in the middle of the Judean desert, guess what there is? The Jordan River. I mean, what a contrast. A life-giving river in the midst of the barren desert. And John said, you can walk out of the barrenness of the desert sands and you can walk into the river of life-giving water. He was showing people very clearly that God doesn't just live in the temple in Jerusalem, but that when you confess and repent of your sins, God meets you right where you are, even in the desert experiences of life. And God himself alone becomes the life-giving, refreshing water of forgiveness, even though even though you may be in the desert. And like the river, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace flows into your life and into the life of anyone who is willing to get real before God, confess their sins, and who are willing to follow God. God is able to meet you, and God is able to meet your needs even in the dry, cracked, parched places of your life. He looked different. He was lo where he was located was different. What he was leading was different. And finally, the way he lived was different. 
I mean, unlike the religious leaders of his day, John the Baptist understood the truth of God's word, and he lived it out every day. He was a man of courage who was willing to take a stand for the Lord and take a stand for the word of God against all the politically correct, progressively woke crowd of his day, even those who claimed to be serving God. He understood that anyone could just go along with the crowd. Anyone could simply follow tradition for the sake of tradition. But he wanted to make a difference for Jesus. He wanted to prepare people for the ministry of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. What about us, church? What about you, Christian? He was willing to be different so that he could make a difference. He was willing to be different so he could make a difference. I wonder today, are we willing to be different so that we can make a difference for Jesus? Or do you just want to be like everybody else? What I know is this. We need to help people all around us understand that there is living water in the desert of this life. Jesus is that living water. In fact, Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, 14, But whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. In fact, the water that I give him will become a well of water, springing up in him for eternal life. You know what? No matter today who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter where you've been, no matter where you may be headed, there is water in the desert for your life, and his name is Jesus. John the Baptist was a man of God who lived and left a legacy of standing strong. Secondly, John the Baptist lived and and left a legacy of standing strong because John the Baptist was on mission from God. Not only was he a man of God, he was on a mission from God. Now what about your life this morning? Are you living life with direction or no direction? Are you living life with purpose or no purpose? Are you living life without hope? Or with hope? Are you living life in the chaos and confusion of this world? Or are you living life with clarity and commitment to the Lord? John the Baptist lived his life on mission from God. Two things you notice about that. Thing number one, you see the purpose of his life was in Jesus. The purpose of his life was found in Jesus. You know, apart from Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is probably the most theologically significant figure in all the Gospels. Like Jesus, his cousin, his entrance into the world was was marked by the announcement, a proclamation by an angel, and divine intervention. His public ministry ended when he started preaching. It It ended 400 years of silence where there had been no prophet in the land for 400 years, four centuries not a word from God not a prophet until John the Baptist showed up and the first thing he did was preach repentance listen to how the apostle John in the gospel of John describes John the Baptist in in the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 6 through 9 (coughs) he says this there was a man sent from God whose name was John he came as a witness to testify about the light the light is Jesus So that all may believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. In the Gospel of John 1 verse 23, John the Baptist talked about his purpose being found in Jesus. When John the Baptist says of himself, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, just just as Isaiah the prophet said. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, author and pastor Rick Warren says this about the value of finding your purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, and I quote, Rick Warren says, Without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. You cannot fulfill God's purposes for your life while focusing on your own plans. So whose purposes are you living for today? It's fair to say this morning that if you do not find your life's purpose in living for and serving Jesus, then you will surrender your life and your opinions and expectations 
to others, the expectations of others, to things like money, to things like resentment or fear or anxiety or your ego. You, you are designed to worship God. He created you for himself. He created you to worship him and to serve him and to serve others. And if you fail to do so, then what you will do, you will substitute God in your life and for other things that you create. And you will give your life over to these idols of this world. And far too many people who walk through the doors of the church on Sunday, they're living for and giving their lives to the purposes of other people and other things and other groups and other organizations, or they're living life for their own purposes and not for the things of God. And when we do that, we forfeit the rich blessings of God in our lives. John the Baptist, the purpose of his life was in Jesus. Secondly, the priority of his life was in Jesus. I could say a lot about this, but let me just say very quickly, Jesus was such a priority for the life and ministry of John the Baptist that he would say in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 1, verse 27, he is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. I mean, Jesus was such a priority to him. He said, let me tell you something about Jesus. He is so great. He is so marvelous he is so magnificent he is so powerful that i am not even worthy to take the dusty dirty nasty sandals off his feet his purpose for his life was found in jesus the priority of his life was found in jesus john the baptist lived and left a legacy of standing strong why he was a man of God who was on a mission from God. And one final quick thing. He lived and left a legacy, a legacy of standing strong because John the Baptist had a message from God. A message from God. Right there in verse 1 and 2, it said, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. His message was simple. His message was straightforward. I mean, think about it. He spent 30 years preparing to preach this message. And when he stood up and he preached, his message was short. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I mean, you would think in 30 years of preparation that his sermon may have been more than that. But he said, there's nothing more than that. You've got to repent. You've got to repent. It's amazing what he said here. He said, confess and turn away from your sin while you still can before it's too late. It's amazing to me to think that John the Baptist's first sermon and Jesus' first sermon was the same sermon. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is coming near. We know that to repent is to confess your sins and mistakes and failures to God and take a new direction in your life. It's turning from sin and self and turning to the Savior. Pastor Robbie Gallaty at Long Hollow Church in Gallatin wrote this about repentance. He says, repentance is an inward, deeply introspective understanding that produces an outward, measurable shift in your actions and desires. It's an about face. Three quick things I want to say to you about this repentance preached by John. Number one, you see the application of repentance. What was the application of repentance? It is when you apply repentance to your life, what you receive is forgiveness. Forgiveness. If we repent and turn from our sins, we can experience God's forgiveness in our lives for our sins, mistakes, and failures. When we confess our sin, we are agreeing with God and seeing sin in our own life the way God sees it. Now, it's for this reason of the dramatic shift and change in our life that we know that many people who walk through the doors of the church have never truly repented and turned from sin. Because everywhere in the Bible where you see 
that true repentance took place that always resulted in a changed life. Every time. Every time. If there is no change, there was no repentance. If there is no change, there was no confession. And if there was no confession and there was no repentance, there was never salvation. And we see this in the life of so many people who walk through the doors of the church. I mean, they're really good church members. They live with a good sense of morality, but they're lost in their sin because they've never repented. They've never received the application of that repentance, which is God's forgiveness. So we see the application of repentance. Secondly, we see the affirmation of repentance. You see what what John says here in verse 7 and verse 8 is, all the way down even to verse 9, John the Baptist clearly is pointing out that a real relationship with Jesus bears fruit. He talks about that fruit. He said, he said, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. This is what he said to the religious leaders. There is undeniable evidence that a person has repented and turned from their sin. The fruit and evidence and affirmation of repentance is a changed life. A changed life. John the Baptist points out two, peop- two types of people who came to hear him preach that day. As they were standing on the bank of the Jordan River, he says there's two types of folks who are here. There are sinners genuinely seeking forgiveness, and there are self-righteous folks seeking to condemn others. One group is interested in hearing from God and seeing their life changed. The other is present so that others can hear from them and they can maintain status quo. The religious leaders John the Baptist was speaking to were all about good works, thinking that these good works and following religious rituals and following religious rules made them righteous and right in the eyes of God. And John the Baptist is pointing out here that they have it all backwards. And so many times, so do we. They believed that good works and religious action would result in repentance. And that's not true. What John the Baptist and Jesus teach us, and throughout all the New Testament, what we learn is this. Repentance leads to good works and bearing fruit. It's not the other way around. Someone has said it like this, the root of one's life ultimately will reveal the fruit of one's life. Many on the bank of the river were holding on to their good works and even their allegiance to Abraham as a sign of their repentance and salvation. And there are many people today who do the same. They hold on to their good works of life their Christian actions that they've taken, like walking an aisle and filling out a card and being baptized, maybe even praying a prayer of some kind. However, we know from the Word of God, without repentance, without the confession of sin and repentance, all these works, even these, quote, Christian actions, are worthless and have no meaning. The application of repentance is forgiveness. The affirmation of repentance is fruit. And the final thing is this, the allocation of repentance is a future. In verse 10, John the Baptist says, The axe is already being laid at the root of the tree. Now he means by that, there's, there's imminent judgment and accountability to God that is coming for everyone. Why is it that the tree would be cut down? It's because it doesn't produce fruit. A tree that has been planted to grow and produce fruit that doesn't produce fruit has lost its purpose for existence. Jesus says it ought to be cut down. John the Baptist says it ought to be cut down. The Apostle Paul would later say it ought to be cut down. James would say it ought to be cut down. gets cut down because it doesn't produce the fruit of repentance. And I want you to know today that unless there is genuine repentance, 
we are not in fellowship with God. Unless there is genuine repentance, we are not in the will of God. And the baptism that John the Baptist was doing in the Jordan River was nothing more than an outward expression of an inward change that had taken place through the confession or repentance of sin. Now I'm going to conclude with telling you this. How important is repentance? Listen to this. At the end of 1985, a mission organization assigned a new family to work as missionaries in a predominantly Muslim city in the Middle East. For decades, this evangelical denomination had labored in that city with missionaries and over all those decades only had produced five small, weak mission churches that each had just a handful of members. So this new mission family came into that predominantly Muslim city and they gathered together the other 14 members of those churches and they began praying together for God to do have a breakthrough in the lives of Muslim people. They started out praying for God to save Muslim people, for God to change Muslim people. But during that all-night prayer meeting, God spoke to the missionary families and the church members and said, basically, the problem is not with the Muslim people. The problem is I do not have a clean vessel in this city that I can use. I don't have a clean vessel in the city that I can use. And the missionary families and these few members fell on their face in the dirt floor and they began confessing and repenting of their sin. And God revealed everything in their lives that was hindering their work and the movement of God in that city. And as they repented that night, Starting the next day, a revival broke out in that Muslim city. The missionary family and the members of those five small churches began proclaiming the gospel with boldness that they had never had before. And listen to this. In the next three and a half years, just the next three and a half years, 132 thousand Muslim men, women, boys, and girls prayed and gave their life to Jesus. And by 1989, the beginning of 1989, three and a half years later, those five churches was now 156 churches. In three and a half years. Now, How did it come about? How did it come about? Repentance. Repentance. There is no revival unless there's first repentance. There is no renewal unless there's first repentance. There is no revitalization unless there's first repentance. There is no salvation unless there is first repentance. And maybe it is the reason that we are not as effective as we ought to be. Maybe the reason we don't see God move the way we want God to move. Maybe the reason our city is not different and our culture is not different and our family is not different and our school is not different, our teams are not different and our jobs are not different is because maybe, just maybe, we've not stopped being religious long enough to realize that what God wants from us is not more religion and not more rituals, but what God wants from us is repentance and a true relationship. And today you can have that. Dear friends, if ever we were living in a day of deserts, it's right now. We're living in the desert. But the Jordan River runs right through the center of the desert. And John the Baptist steps out of the desert and into the river. And John the Baptist says, hey guys, everybody that's standing in the desert right now, listen to me. You can come out of the desert and the dry 
empty, cracked, parched life you're living with no meaning and purpose. And you can step foot in the life-giving waters. And if you'll confess and repent, the Lord will change you forever. So maybe today that's where it needs to start with us. I don't know about you, but today that might be the day and the place we start. Is right here at this altar, standing, kneeling, sitting, saying, God, forgive me, and, and repenting of sin. For some, that repentance is going to look like salvation because if you come and confess and repent of your sin and really humble yourself before God, for the first time, you're going to be saved, no matter how many times you've been baptized or filled out a card or walked an aisle or whatever. And there are people that need to do that today. Some need to come publicly professing their faith in Jesus. Some need to come and join this church. Some just need to come to this altar and get some things right. John the Baptist lived and left a legacy of standing strong. I pray the same would be true for us. Let's pray together. And now, Father, in the quietness of this moment, speak to our hearts. Draw us unto yourself. Show us, Father, the places where you want to work. Right now, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God works in our midst, calling us to yourself. Folks inside this building, folks watching online, I pray, God, today would be the day that it all changes for us. And help us to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and sing with us. And as the Holy Spirit of God leads you, we invite you to come this morning. You be the first that steps out and comes today. Others have already come. You come. Let's sing together.
this morning, if you will, be seated for just a few moments. If you're out there watching online today, you can continue responding to the invitation today right there at fbclexington.com, Sunday Central. You can find a tab that says Responding to God. It's a red tab. You can click on that red tab, and you can, you can fill that out, and that's going to come directly to me. And you can tell us the decision you've made today, or you can text us at 81010, and in the subject line, put at FBC online. Someone will immediately respond to you, and you can tell us who you are and the decision you made, or you can email me today at clayhallmark at fbclexington.com. One quick thing I want to say to you is we have this Wednesday night, Adult and Teen Challenge will be our special guest down in the Fellowship Hall after supper this Wednesday night, and they'll be presenting their program. They haven't been with us in a couple of years. It's a very important ministry here in our community, in our area. Our Lifeline Recovery that happens on Monday and Thursday night is partnered with uh, teen, Adult and Teen Challenge. So you'll want to come and be with us this Wednesday night as we do that. And then the subsequent Wednesday nights, we're going to be having some special, uh, special uh, times together as we'll be having some mission reports and other things. And then, the, then in September, we will launch into all of our new life groups. One of the things that we always do here at First Baptist Church as school is beginning is we want to take time to be able to pray for all of our administrators, our teachers, our faculty members, our, our homeschool parents, all of those things uh, here in our church. So if you are one of those people, if you teach anywhere around in any of our school systems or you're a homeschool teacher or anything like that, I want to invite you to come from where you are right here at the front right now so that we can pray over you. So if you would get up and if you would come, please. While they're coming, pray for our folks to San Antonio mission trip as they'll be returning home. Uh, I don't have all the figures yet, but I know the first day of their work and the first night that they were having with the Scott Dawson Evangelistic Association, I know that there were over 500 people that trusted their life to Jesus, which is really awesome. And we will get word of the rest of that later. And we will get word of the rest of that later. They'll be reporting to us here in just a couple of weeks on a Wednesday night, and so we want to certainly do that. Now, this morning we have uh, uh, a lot of our folks still coming. There you go. Uh, we are so thankful that we have a church that is filled with people that work in our school systems all around our area, that are homeschool parents, that give their life each and every day to the lives of our students, and we are so very, very proud of them, so very thankful for them. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to join me, not just praying for them today, but you'll pray for them in the days to come, as they have the opportunity to be shining lights for Jesus Christ in the lives of students right here all around our area. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for each and every one of these, Father, who are standing here today, for those that are out there watching online today, those that were also in first service today. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their commitment. We thank you for their dedication, not only to one another and to the places where they serve, be it in a school or a school system or their home, Father, but the fact that they are committing themselves first to you. And in doing so, Lord, they're then committing themselves to their children that they teach, the students they come in contact with, and the opportunity they have to make a difference. I pray, God, your blessing over each one of these. We pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would help them to seek you in all things. We pray that you would make them shining lights that cannot be dimmed by this dark world, Father, as they walk into those classrooms and into those times of teaching and leading and coaching and all the things that they're doing, Father, that they would be a difference maker for you, Lord Jesus, in the lives of students. I pray, Father, that, that students would come to know you as Lord and Savior and find hope in you because of these. Pray your blessing over our schools. We pray that you would protect them and just put your hedge of protection about them, Father, and let the Holy Spirit of God reign in and out of our schools. And we'll be careful to honor you and praise you and glorify you, God, for all that you do. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank these today. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here today. If you're a guest today, we are so glad to have you. If you're a guest and you have never been to the pastor's reception, I want to personally invite you to come. If you're in the bottom floor, it's out the back, back doors, down the steps, and to the right if you're in the balcony. If you go to the back and to the steps, to the very bottom and straight across, you'll come right to the pastor's reception room. I'd love to see you, the opportunity to meet you. We have a gift we want to give you. There's a snack there. There's coffee. There's soft drinks. And we look forward to the opportunity to get to see you there in just a few minutes, all right? This morning, we're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. And so thank you so much for being here today. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to worship you today. And we pray that as we go forth from this place, we'll carry that good news that we have talked about today. The need for repentance, but your willingness to forgive. And that we would share this message with all of those around us. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.